Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Savannah if you're new here and I do videos on Tuesdays and Fridays. This is one of my every other um, Tuesday videos which are book commentaries, the whole reason I started my channel. If you are new here, basically what it is is I read through a book. I have sparkles on my face. I just got done filming another video and I took it off and now I'm doing this one. <laughs> um, anyways, I read a book. I take notes while I'm reading. So if you don't want spoilers, I would recommend reading the book first. But if you want like a summary of the book and to kind of hear my opinions and tune in. Um, so I read the book. I kind of summarize it, tell you what's going on as the book is progressing. Of course, I can't include everything because then these would be even longer than they are and they already are long. And then I also just give my thoughts and a opinions and feelings like while I'm reading the book and then also at the end of the book kind of my overall thoughts and feelings on the book so yeah so that's what these videos are it's the whole reason I started my channel I love these videos um and yeah so today uh is covering the second book in a duology by Su Lin Tan and the second book is Heart of the Sun Warrior these books are so beautiful the first one was Goddess um or Daughter of the Moon Goddess, which was the previous video to this one for book videos. This is what it looks like. It's so beautiful. I love the artwork on these books. So beautiful. And also, I will say, like I said in the first book, um, this these books are like have Chinese myth interwoven within them, and the characters are Chinese. And so I looked up the pronunciation of these names and like wrote them down, practiced them like while I was reading, making sure I said them, you know, correctly. However, I don't speak Chinese. So even with my practicing and trying to say them as accurately as possible, I am going to say that most likely I am saying the names incorrectly. And I do apologize for that. And just know I am trying my best. <laughs> And I did look up every name while I was reading to make sure that I was pronouncing things correctly. So I'm doing my best and I'm saying them as best as I can. So just like know that. And if I still am saying them wrong, I am sorry. I did look them up. I'm saying them as best as I can without, you know, like only using the internet's you know, pronunciation and not like getting to actually hear a human being say it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. So anyways, let's get into this. This is the second book and this is a duology. And if you're curious about any of the makeup I use, um, I always list it in the description box down below. And if I use single shadows, which for my book videos, I do a lot, I list like the names and the brand and all that kind of stuff. So Thoughts before we get into the book. I was really excited to start and finish this duology. The last book ended in a way to where it could have really been a standalone, but there was still enough like left at the end to where it's like there could be a second book. So I was get, like curious to see what would happen with the book and how the writing is in this book as well. Like will it be the same or will parts sometimes feel like rushed, cut short, um, because I did note in the previous book that it did feel at times that like parts were rushed and cut short, like they'd be in the middle of a fighting scene and then all of a sudden it would just be over immediately. And so I did note that with the first book and I was kind of curious to see if the author's writing kind of continued that way or if you know her writing had developed a little bit and wasn't that way anymore so I did note that um, I enjoyed the last book but did again note sometimes that it felt like scenes were cut short my eyes are watering because I did my makeup already today my my skin and my eyes do not like having my makeup done multiple times a day and like taking it off and redoing it I don't normally film two videos a day. Um, anyways, so it did feel like scenes were like cut short or ended quickly, which left me feeling like something was missing sometimes. Like I would be like, you know, it'd kind of be building up and then the scene would end so abruptly. I would be like, oh, like we're just moving on. Okay. Okay. Um, 
But the back of the book summary says, because I always kind of give you a summary of the summary. So the emperor is tightening his grip on his power, and there's a strange magic all of a sudden on the moon, like something is going on on the moon with the moon. Um, Xing Yin ends up having to flee her home yet again, and this time she goes with companions to unexplored lands in the immortal realm. She ends up having to seek aid from a former enemy. I'm assuming that the aid she has to seek is from the demon realm. If you remember from the first book, the demon realm was originally the cloud wall area, and the emperor banned like the magic that people from that area have. Um, and they kind of like spread stories about the people from that area to deter um, anyone from wanting to go there, from wanting to interact from anyone uh, with anyone from there, outcasting them basically. So <clears throat> Xing Yin is the main female character in this. Um, duology. She was the main character in the first book. She continues to be the main character, but there are others that are in the book frequently as well that are like secondary, secondary type characters, but still like in it enough to be considered like kind of like a main character situation. So Shang Yin's life force has recovered quicker than expected. Some quality the moon has aided in that. So if you remember the last book ended Xing Yin had to give up like a huge chunk of her life force to give the dragons their um I think it was their life force that was like stuck in the pearls um it was to give them their life force back so no one could control them anymore and her life force she knew it would like eventually come back but she knew it would take a lot of time but there's some type of force on the moon turns out to be the laurel tree that's there um that was regenerating her life force way quicker than it should have and faster than she had expected it to regenerate this is patchy over here uh it is not this eyeshadow it is my eye not wanting to cooperate after just having had makeup on so just know that this side makeup's not going to look good uh, my eyes are not cooperating but it is not the eyeshadow i promise you moving on um so shingen has been back on the moon for a year so the last book ended with her finally being able to go home and like reunite with her mom and it is now a year later and I will say, I still do not understand how old Xing Yin is. The author never clarifies this, and I know why. So, like, Xing Yin and all of them that are immortals, it's constantly noted how, like, the time just flies by and passes by because when you're immortal, it means, like, nothing to you. And so, Xing Yin, I know, and, like, Li Wei are younger, but I'm not sure like how young, like in the first book, they were still getting education. And so I assumed they were like maybe 16 to 18. But then Xing Yin's father, like they had said that he would be like old and gray in the first book by this point. And I'm like, okay, so if he's already maybe like 80, Xing Yin would be like at least in her 30s, I would think. So I don't know how old she is. Uh, or leeway like I still cannot figure it out so I'm thinking maybe they're even older than I have kind of guessed before and that maybe their education goes for longer because of their aging I don't know anyway so she's been home for a year I just wanted to throw that in there because it's honestly a little confusing um like I was honestly confused so she's been home for a year she is starting to note that she's kind of tired of the mundane life that is the moon. Um, but, <clears throat> um, it, like, she notes that, but then I'm like, why don't you, like, leave and go do things and come back and visit your mom? Like, you're free to leave. I, I don't understand that. Um, 
And now, so the last book ended where it was like Li Wei and Xing Yan were engaged, but now they are not engaged, but they're not single either. It's like they're like, I don't know, on this like precipice of like they're kind of engaged, but they're not fully engaged, but they're also not single. A little confusing, honestly. Like it's a wee bit confusing, their relationship. And it's like that throughout the entire book, basically. I don't know. Anyways, um, so that's still interesting. So now there are strangers that come to the moon. And they've had visitors and stuff, but usually people, like, just come to the moon. And it's kind of like people wanting to engage in gossip and see what's what because no one's ever been allowed on the moon before. And so they kind of are using, like, Shingen and her mom as almost like zoo animals like they're coming to kind of just see what it's really like and what they're really like but they actually have these guests show up that want to fully stay on the moon and Shingen's immediately like uh no but her mom allows them to stay out of you know like being respectful and being like a good host and manners and things like that. I had to sneeze. So there's the guest there. And Xing Yin is very um, on guard and she does not trust the one guy. So there's four guests in total. So there's one older gentleman who Xing Yin doesn't really pay much attention to. There's two women that end up being like inconsequential. Like they literally are there to legitimately be guests. And then there's one um, younger guy, and he's the one that Xing Yin is questioning. She doesn't trust. He has, like, a menacing look about him, she thinks. Um, and so they're all there for, like, different reasons. And so she's kind of on guard trying to see what is going on. Um, but it turns out the one guest that she didn't expect or suspect, the older gentleman, is the one that is actually the problem guest. So um, he was attacking the laurel tree, which um, the laurel tree turned out to be the one that was like regenerating Shingen's powers it, or magic. Uh, it has regenerative properties, and so you can't like damage it or harm it in any way, basically. And, like, it has these seeds on it that Shingen her whole entire life had tried to pick off of it. And they literally won't come off. Like, you can't do anything to this tree. And so she found this guy attacking the laurel tree. And she saw that he was actually using his blood. Like, he would slice his hands. And he would, like, drip it on to the tree bark. And he would strike the tree. And he was using it to get the seeds of the tree. Um, and that was actually working. So something with his blood allowed him to weaken the tree enough before it regenerated itself and healed itself to steal some of the seeds. And so she's not sure why or what the seeds do. I don't think she knows about the regenerative properties yet. I'm not totally sure. Um, but the man before he fled claimed that the tree and the seeds belonged to him. And she's like, what the heck? Who is this? Like, who is this man? I've never seen him before. This tree has been on the moon forever. Like, who is this guy claiming that this stuff all of a sudden belongs to him? Like, it doesn't make sense. So then, moving on, she's kind of like questioning. Her and Lee Wei don't really know who this person was or how you would even find him, whatever. Um... And her and Li Wei officially get engaged. But again, like I said, it's like an on and off engagement. I don't know. It's interesting. I will note that more throughout the book and at the end because I have feelings about this. Anyways. Um, but, so they're officially engaged, but it will be a while still due to his parents hating her. So, like, they're not planning on moving forward with this engagement anyway, anytime soon. And so, because his parents hate her and her family, and she doesn't want to leave her mom just yet. My thing is, like, girl, you could go visit. Like, you're free to leave and go visit. I don't understand why she, like, harps on this. Um, 
I still don't really get it even after reading everything. But anyways, so it's like there she is agreed to she's agreed to be engaged with him, but like she's definitely not ready to marry him in any way. And even though she's agreed to be engaged, she constantly notes how she doesn't want to be empress. She would hate being empress. She doesn't want to be locked up in the Jade Palace, which she wouldn't be locked up, but you know, because she's empress, she would have to be there and like attending all of these meetings and doing all these things. And like, she doesn't want to do any of that. And she notes that regularly um, to herself, not to Leeway, to herself. Um, so then we learn, so she's still staying on the moon, even though she's like accepted this engagement to Leeway. And we learn that Wenji, the villain of the last story, who she supposedly hates, is still going and visiting her regularly on the moon. Like, he's been showing up to visit her. Um, Shingen hasn't seen him at all. She refuses to, like, go out and see him. But he's been going regularly, attempting to see her. And now she chooses to go and see him for the first time uh, in a year like, I mean, he's been going and visiting her the whole time she's been on the moon, and she's refused to see him. So she now finally goes and sees him. Um, she's, Shingen to me is very childish with how easily she kind of like forgives and doesn't take into consideration the past. Like, some would say that's like a mature quality, but the way Shingen goes about it, not that. Like, the forgiveness isn't childish, but the way that Shingen, like, talks about her emotions and what she's battling and, like, how she's feeling and how she'll, like, deny her emotions to herself and try to, like, hide and push things down. It just reminds me of, like, very childish, immature behavior. So, anyways, um... She said she doesn't forgive him, but she stupidly still has some feelings for him. And I say stupidly because of how she talks about it. Like, because of how she talks about it, it just, it's very annoying, honestly. I was super annoyed throughout this book because of Shingen. Like, she was really starting to make me mad. Um... So she still has feelings for him. Uh, he supposedly wants to be allies, but he is attempting to, like, get her back oh, again from Leeway for himself. Like, he doesn't want to just be allies. Like, he is attempting to have her for himself again and steal her from Leeway again. Um, also, at this point, we learn that the general that was, like, the right-hand man for the emperor that hates Shingen and her mom for we don't know why, um, now is co-general of the army to get the army back under the emperor's control. Because when the emperor was, like, attempting to punish Shingen for, like, duping him with the pearls in the last book, the army stood up for her and, like, vowed, like for her and everything and he didn't like that and so yeah so he put his right hand man there that he trusts stupidly um he put him like in charge of the army and that guy hates Shingen and her mom and he's just like a really evil person he also tries to get the emperor like it's been noted he has tried multiple times to even get the emperor to like have issues with his own child, Bui Wei. So it's very interesting. Um, so Xing Yin goes to attend the emperor's birthday ball with Li Wei to see if they can coexist with his parents or not. Like to see if his parents have at least like moved on enough to be able to like announce their engagement, to be able to say that they're engaged, that they're going to marry see if they'll accept her, that type of thing. And, like, the thing is, is Shingen's mom and her have never done anything, like, personally to the emperor. They hold their grudges because of, like, um, Chama taking the elixir and all of that stuff. Like, they don't believe or have any... 
like understanding of the predicament she was in when she had to take the elixir. So they go to the ball or the his party and I just feel bad for Leeway. Like Shingen needs to make up her mind and move on from either Leeway or Wenji. Like she can't have both but she tries to have both. Um, she's stringing Leeway along and she keeps hurting him with her stupid decisions. Like I was really annoyed and let me tell you it really doesn't get any better. Oh boy now I got a little out of control. Um, like she just strings poor Leeway along and is so awful to Leeway. Like uh, justice for leeway, honestly. Like, that's how I felt throughout this whole entire book. Okay. Uh, so then, a guest on the moon that betrayed them and was, like, attacking the Laurel turned out to be General Wu, the guy that the, was the, is the emperor's right-hand man that he, you know, put in charge of the army now. Turns out it was him. Interesting. Apparently he had been, so this is his background. So, and for some reason, like, they didn't go to the emperor with this information. They, like, kept it to themselves. I don't know. I still don't quite understand that thought process. But apparently, Wu there, which his whole name, I'm not, I'm just going to leave it as General Wu. I'm not going to do his whole name. So apparently... He had actually been a mortal before. Yeah. Wu was a mortal. I know. Just wild. I don't know. So he was a mortal. And then his wife ended up cheating on him with an immortal. And he learned about this and was hella pissed. He was like real, real mad. And so he um, found out the secrets of immortals and what they were susceptible to. Because there's this... So immortals aren't allowed to be in the mortal realm, but there is this like one city, under I hurt so bad. There is this one city that is in the mortal realm that the immortals are allowed to like live in if they live down there. And so he went there and like learned the secrets of the immortals and what they're susceptible to and how to kill them because they can't be killed. And so he learned this information and then he killed his wife and the immortal that she was sleeping with. And he was punished, obviously, by the emperor. And his punishment was to chop the laurel tree down. But the laurel tree has healing powers, um, healing regenerative powers. And so obviously he tried to chop it down and nothing would happen. And he attempted to do this for like over a hundred years, but the tree, like, you know, nothing was happening and then finally after like a hundred over a hundred years he finally learned like his blood weakened the tree because he somehow ended up having a tie to it because of all this stuff and so he finally was able to chop the tree down but because it had these regenerative powers after he chopped it down it actually grew back but it was different when it grew back um like it, it its properties kind of like changed and now he can't ever injure it enough to fully chop it down but he can still injure it um so that's why he has a connection to it and why he said like the laurel seeds and the tree itself belonged to him because he has a very long history with it um also leeway then so they're at the party she realizes that this guest was general Wu in disguise and she's really mad and the previous general kind of tells her the background because he's been around long enough to remember when Wu was even like made immortal brought to you know doing his punishment all of those types of things um so that that kind of happens and then all of a sudden uh like the emperor and the empress are mad that Shingen is there. And then, um, for the first time ever, Chang'e does not light the lanterns on the moon. So the moon doesn't show up. And this is seen, um, and it's the emperor's birthday. And like, they were in this place to celebrate that, um, like the moon plays a big part in like how it looks when the moon is lit. 
I don't know. And so this was seen as like a huge like backhanded slap basically to the emperor on his birthday and seen as like a really bad omen. And so they were super mad. And they basically were like, Tilly Way, like, you need to denounce her right now. Like, you can't be friends. And telling Shin Yen that her and her mom were going to be punished because, you know, the deal is that her mom always has to fulfill her tasks. And after however many years she's been there, this is the first time that she hasn't. So Shin Yen's like, there's something wrong. Like, I need to go home. But anyways, um... But Li Wei wouldn't denounce Shing Yin. He's like defending her, saying, no, there's got to be something wrong. Like, we'll go check it out and make sure that Chung Na is okay. And, you know, we will, you know, like, fix it. But he won't, the emperor won't listen. Um, but Shing Yin and Li Wei end up leaving to investigate the situation and check on her mom. And she's not on the moon. So, General Wu definitely is the culprit for why Chang'e did not complete her task for the first time ever. So basically, she received a note because if we remember correctly in the last book, uh, Chang'e's husband, who had been mortal, is dead. Okay, she received a note to go to his grave that she visits often because she will... Um, like receive an answer or something like that and she goes and she sees her husband and she like chases him down but she ends up losing him she can't find him and she is like a wreck um but anyway so like Shingen sends her home she's like go home like leeway lit the lanterns while Shingen went to look for her when they realized she wasn't on the moon and she's like go home you know, just wait for me there. Like, we're kind of in trouble. Like, we're going to have to deal with the emperor. But for some reason, they were like, we're not going to tell him about the note you received. I don't know. I'm like, why? Because that will help explain why she didn't. I don't know. Anyways. So, Shing Yin starts to investigate because she's like, I mean, my mom's never done anything like this before. I don't know why she would say that she saw her husband if she didn't actually see him. And Shing Yin finds her dad, who they thought was dead. I was like, whoa. I knew it. I knew he was alive. I said in the last book, there's no way he's, oh, dumb phone. I was like, there's no way he's dead. Like, he has to be alive. He is. I was right. I'm proud of myself. Okay. So, anyway, so, um, but he is dying. So he is dying, but he is alive at the moment. So what happened? This is what happened. So her dad was actually the original master of the Jade Dragon Bow, which is the one Shing Yin has. And he's the one that, he's the one that helped to save the dragons when they were in peril and like put their life forces in the pearls for whatever reason. But then he was too weak to give them their life forces back. And the emperor had been jealous of him having control of the dragons and was worried that he would attempt to try and, like, take over and rule himself. But Shang Yin's dad, Ho Yi, had no desire to do any type of, like, ruling or taking over the emperor's, like, position. But the emperor was super, you know, like, worried about it and nervous. And so... He went to Hoi and he said that um, the mortals were um, are going to face a calamity and only he could save them. And Hoi was worried about the mortals and so the emperor tricked him into becoming a mortal himself. Um, which the emperor can make immortals mortal and then he can bring them back to immortality again or whatever. And so the emperor tricked him to become a mortal, but he didn't tell Ho Yi that he would have to be mortal for a very long time for this calamity. And so Ho Yi was actually, um, he led multiple mortal lives before he finally 
Um, because when an immortal is made mortal, they keep like regenerating and being reborn. So they don't really die, but they don't remember their immortal life or anything like that either. So keep that in mind. My eye is twitching. Um, so finally the calamity struck, which was the, um, like the whole Phoenix, the sun situation, the 10 suns, all that kind of stuff. And so after that, you know, he's kind of just been chilling because he hasn't died yet. So if he dies, he will forget like his life as Chunga's husband and he'll forget that he had a daughter and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, so he'll just forget everything. So Shingen's like, I have to save him before he dies because then he'll forget everything and will lose him. And the only reason why he remembers um, his immortal life, because technically he's not supposed to, is, um, I forget, something happened. Oh, when, um, Chunga took the, Im the elixir of immortality, there was like a drop of it left and he took a sip of it and it brought back his memories from when he was immortal. So he remembers like his immortal life before and also his life now. And so, yeah, but if he dies, then they'll lose their husband, father, like he won't remember them or anything. And so, um, the only way for him to return to immortality is to get an elixir of immortality. And so, um, we kind of see that the emperor's hatred for Xingyan and Chang'e goes back even further than we thought because of this situation. Yeah, so his hatred goes back really far and he purposely got rid of Ho Yi so he could attempt to have the dragons to control himself, but obviously like that didn't end up working out. Um, Xingyan is determined now to save her father and make him immortal once more and to reunite her family, which she has always wanted to do. And she doesn't tell her mom about finding her dad in case she fails because she doesn't want to get her mom's hopes up and like break her heart all over again. And it also is interesting that Ho Yi was tricked into saving the mortals um, by angering and like that then angered the Empress and the Emperor helped him to do it. So it's just like super messy and it's like, I don't know. The Empress needs to wake up and realize that it was all the Emperor's doing and not be so hateful towards Shingen and her family, but we know that won't happen, so. Anywho, it's just very messy. So then her thought is, oh, well, I gotta save my dad. And so her plan is to steal an elixir of immortality, so. Sure, that will go well for Shingen. I'm sure that will go well. So that's kind of her thought process is I'm going to steal an elixir because it's the only way to get one because you know the emperor won't give her one. So, um, <clears throat> so then the emperor kind of exacts his vengeance for them missing, like lighting the lanterns on the moon and he lets Chunga go from her position and her and Shingen are to await punishment and they're not allowed to leave the moon. So they're like stuck there, kind of imprisoned there, such things. Um, but before like the wards went up to fully like trap them on the moon, Shingen knows that like that night is her last night to attempt to steal an elixir. And she ends up working with this guy, his name is Tao, to steal an elixir um, from, like, the vault. And he claims that there should be, like, two. Like, he thinks that there are two. They're not. There's not. Um, but he thinks there's two. So they go through this whole process of stealing this elixir. But there was actually only one bottle. And so he stabs her in the back, basically. Not literally, but... Um, and he takes the elixir... And so now she doesn't have an elixir for her father. So she's kind of back, back at the first step. And, you know, that's the only way to get save her father. So she doesn't really know what to do. 
So then they're kind of like awaiting their punishment and they realize that um, General Wu there is going to bring like a bunch, <clears throat> my, bring a bunch of soldiers and like hostily take them captive. And they're going to be like, sent to this tower that's on the edge of the kingdom where they'll be left like in the dark alone forever and forgotten like over time and so that's a no so they're like we have to flee the moon um like we have to flee there's no no way we're gonna go do that um so they escape but they barely escape and it was like a super messy fight situation wenji ended up coming to the rescue um uh, but in their escape the attendant that had served um, Chunga and been a, like a second mother to Shingen her whole life was killed. Um, so that was really sad and everything. And so General Wu, he's just super evil and you can't seem to be able to beat him. It's really sad. Like, I don't understand. He seems to be able to just like outsmart you and keep going about his business. Um, I'm not quite sure. So then I note here that I'm going to be kind of annoyed if Shingen ends up with Wenji because like I understand he's like the morally gray character which I'm usually for but she really loved loved and loves Li Wei and Li Wei really loves her like Li Wei is dedicated to Shingen and it makes me very sad um like it ruined him standing up for her ruined his already rocky relationship with his parents and like basically Shen Yen's thought is like if he really loved her like he would give everything up but she knows that he can't do that because he's literally like the only person that can take the throne. I don't know. It's it's messy. It's rocky. It's sad and I am going to feel so bad for Li Wei if he gets like kicked to the curb basically. Um, so then they go to the Southern Sea after they flee, um, because that's where the attendant was originally from. And so they bring her body there for her family and to, like, put her to rest, because that was her last, like, dying breath of wish was to be brought back home. So they bring her there, but the Southern Sea's, like, castle and stuff is actually way under the water, and you need a key to be able to get in. So it's kind of sketchy. I'm trying out a new mascara. I'm really hoping I don't regret this. Um, but yeah, it's under the water, kind of like Atlantis. So that's interesting. Um, so they go to this city, they get in, and their queen is very... Um, like, she's never really chosen a side on history, but when she does choose sides, she's known as kind of, like, always somehow choosing the winning side, so she won't really, like, make decisions unless she's for sure that the side is going to win, and she's kind of always just, like, picking whatever to protect her people, which is, like, that's good, but also at the same time, she ends up not being the best person. So, um, because they're so secluded, they don't get news very often. And so at the moment, they still don't know about like the emperor and the whole situation with Chunga and Xing Yin and them technically being like enemies to the emperor and supposed to be, you know, imprisoned, that type of situation. So they're safe for right now in the Southern Sea, but I was like panicked the whole time they were there because I was like, this is not a good place to be because if they do learn of it, you're literally stuck. Like you're not getting out because even though they have a key to get in right now, the um, queen down there, she can lock up everything like whenever she wants to where no one can escape no matter what you do, like, you would not be able to escape, and I'm just like, this is not a good place to be, um, but they decide to stay until the attendant is laid to rest, which is a few days from when they brought her, and again, I'm just like, you guys are not making good decisions, but they also didn't want to, like, 
alert the queen to, I don't know if I like this mascara very much. They didn't want to alert her to like any, you know, funky business going on or whatever. And they were worried that if they denied her request for them to stay for the attendant's funeral, that like it would look suspicious and she would lock everything down and they'd be stuck there. And so they're kind of just like playing along and hoping to leave after the attendant's funeral and not make, and you know, not seem suspicious basically. So that's kind of what's going on right now. Um, I already covered that. Wenji, interestingly enough, is allowed in the southern kingdom. Like he has the key to get in and out freely whatever he wishes because he kind of is like a friend to the queen because it's a neutral territory like he's kind of befriended the queen and worked there and she doesn't really care that he's from the cloud wall again she kind of like plays multiple sides in history and such things so that's interesting um so he's there uh visiting Shinyan and he tells her to leave uh, oh, no, he tells her that Li Wei is being held captive. So Li Wei had had to go back home. He had been with them on the moon, remember? And then uh, because of how everything was going, they were like, he needs to go back home. Uh, so the relationship between him and his parents doesn't get worse. And who knows what they'll do. And General Wu was able to talk enough bad things in their ear that Li Wei is now being held captive at the palace. So they're like holding him captive um, under guard and his position is just not looking good. So like these people that he had kind of on his side, um, Wu has somehow been able to kind of like remove them from court. And so Li Wei is rather isolated and kind of all by himself. And Wu keeps saying, you know, like these awful things to the emperor. And so Li Wei's position is rather at risk right now. And so the only thing Xing Yin can think of is to reach out to the empress because the one thing that they have in common is their love for Li Wei. Like they don't get along, they have nothing else in common. But they do love Li Wei, so maybe she'll help her to help him get out, is her thought process. Um, because she wants to get Li Wei out of the palace because she just feels like leaving him in there is basically a death sentence. So the Empress ends up meeting up with her in the mortal realm, actually. Like, they go and meet in the mortal realm because it's, like, the one place people probably wouldn't think the Empress would be. Well, this didn't work out because I just ended up smearing mascara even more. Well, my under eyes do not look good. I might have to put shadow down there to cover that up. Um, anyways, so the Empress agrees with Shingen to like get Li Wei out and all of these things, but under like the condition, because of course there's a condition, that Shingen, um, doesn't accept Li Wei's proposal and that she's never allowed to marry him or become empress. Um, and I guess Xing Yan never fully accepted that. And, you know, like I said, they were kind of like, her acceptance is kind of on the fence. Like she hadn't fully accepted yet. And so I guess because of that, she's able to now basically like tell Li Wei she doesn't accept. Um, so she accepts the Empress's terms to get Li Wei out because she realizes it's the only way, but she does make the Empress also have to make a promise. And that was that the Empress is never allowed to harm herself or her kin. And if she does, then her promise to the Empress is broken. So that's kind of the terms. Like, fine, I won't marry Li Wei, but if you ever hurt myself or my kin, then I can marry him, basically. Um, so that was really depressing. I get that she doesn't want to be empress, but 
I feel like it's a small price to pay to be with the one that you love. And she claims to love Li Wei so much and like, you know, whatever. But she's not willing to... Basically, she thinks he should have to give stuff up to be with her, but she's not willing to give up anything to be with him. It's very double-sided, and I never really realized that before. But that's, again, like, why I feel like Shen Yin is behaving so immature and childish is because she, like, wants Li Wei to give up X, Y, and Z for her, but she won't give anything up for him. And it's like, that, you know, goes both ways. You can't expect him to give up everything to be with you, but then you're not willing to give up anything to be with him. So there's that. Um... And also, I think, like, the lifestyle she thinks she'll have, I think it would still be different because when Li Wei is emperor, I'm sure he'll do things differently. But, anyways. Um, so there's that. Oh, and another part of her requirement um, was that the empress would get the guy that stole the elixir. She doesn't tell him what happens? She just says, like, I have this beef with this person. And part of the deal of her getting the way out was the Empress kind of putting the guy that stole the elixir in the same area. So then Shen Yin could get him at the same time. And hopefully he has the elixir on him to then get the elixir from him. That's kind of her thought process. Um, I was super upset at this point. I was just like, I have a gut feeling she's going to end up with Wenji and not Li Wei. And it honestly breaks my heart. And I'm normally always for like the morally gray character, but I love Li Wei. And I'm just like, she is going to screw him over. I can just feel it. Like I can sense it. So keep that in mind. So she rescues Li Wei, but someone else is actually there attempting to rescue Tao, the guy she has an issue with. And it turns out that the person that was rescuing Tao is an old childhood friend of Li Wei's. Um, and he is like, or she is like a sister to him, so he calls her like sister. And it was in the first book he talked about a friend that had moved away. Um, and he, like, loved her dearly. Her name is G. G. And, yeah, so it turns out that's her. And it turns out that she actually is his half-sister. So she is legitimately his sister. Um, the emperor is her father. So the empress is her stepmother. And the empress did not like her. Surprise, surprise. I feel like the empress doesn't like pretty much anybody. Um, so the Empress didn't like her, and she was banished from the Jade Palace when she um, chose to marry a mortal. So she was banished from the Jade Palace when she chose to marry a mortal, um, and her she had to get the elixir for her husband because he is older. Um, and she wanted, you know, she doesn't want him to die, obviously. She loves him. And so she got him the elixir, but when Tao gave it to him, the way Tao was acting, he could tell that, like, something was off, which Tao was acting suspicious because he felt bad because he technically stole the elixir from Shen Yin, who the only reason why he got the elixir was because of her. He would have never gotten it without her help. And so... Um, her husband wouldn't take it because he could, like, sense that there was something off here. And so she gave the elixir back to Shen Yin, um, and Shen Yin promised to help her to get another one when there was one for her husband. So that's kind of going on. So Shen Yin now has the elixir, um, and then she also breaks things off with Li Wei, and she doesn't tell him the truth because that was also part of the Empress's deal, was that you're not allowed to tell him my part in this because she knew that Li Wei would fully cut things off with her if he knew. And so it's really sad. So then Li Wei assumes that she still cares for Wen Ji and that's why she's cutting things off. And she doesn't correct him because she's still confused about her feelings. 
I'm telling you, Leeway is just getting screwed over throughout this whole entire book. I honestly, okay. So then Shingen gets the elixir to her dad. He takes it. He's finally reunited with Chunga. It was super cute and sweet. <sighs> but then, of course, the Eastern. Oh, did I say Southern Sea Queen? Or did I say Eastern? The Eastern Sea Queen learns the situation about them and the Emperor right as they were trying to leave. I'm like, you guys should not have stayed as long as you did. You should have, like, gotten out of there immediately. I even thought to myself, I was like, they should have just, like, because Shingen was in and out the whole entire time. I'm like, you guys should have just left one time and just, like, didn't go back. Hello? Anyways, whatever. Um, so they had to fight to escape. They barely made it out. But, of course, when they get out, the Celestial Army is waiting for them. And General Wu, turns out, he threw a coup and overtook the Emperor in the palace. And so now he's keeping the Emperor alive for now, but just for, you know, certain purposes. And when he's finally accepted as Emperor, he'll kill him. So Wu is now Emperor. Interesting, I guess. So then... Turns out Wu's army, he's actually using dead celestials. Um, he's using the laurel seeds, so they're like alive and he can control them, but they're very zombie-ish. Like their souls aren't in them anymore and they're like dead. They don't really know what they're doing, obviously. They're literally zombies, basically. Um, so then they're kind of like fighting on the beach to get away from him. These zombies, by the way, are basically impossible to kill. Um, and then he had taken, um, because the Eastern Sea Queen was actually about to have, like, a meeting with all of the sea rulers. It's, like, something, I don't know if they do it every year, or it's pretty common. And the East, or the, which, I feel like I messed up. I'm pretty sure that she's the Southern Sea Queen, because the Eastern Sea is where Shingen had been before. Anyways, the sea that she went to before that realm um, in the first book where she has friends and she was friends with like the young prince and um, she was friends with like the prince that's going to inherit the throne and his younger brother. So Wu had actually taken them captive because they had tried to flee when the queen, I'm pretty sure it's the southern sea queen and I messed up earlier, the southern sea queen. When they had tried, uh, they fled when they realized, when she realized that Shingen and her mom were not quite in the standing that she thought they were with the Emperor. And when they had fled, Wu like captured them. And so they're all trying to fight to get out. And during that process, the younger prince that was like the younger boy that Shingen was friends with, um, in like an older sister type way, he ends up getting killed. It was absolutely devastating. Um, it was really sad. And somehow we also learn at this point that Wu has it set up to where even if he is killed, his army will still function and kill everyone. So if he doesn't show back up, you know, to where he has everything, they will know to go out and literally like kill everyone. And because they're basically impossible to kill, this would be a very bad situation. Uh, he cares about absolutely no one or anything. And I was really sad about the prince's death. It felt very unnecessary. Like, he did not have to be killed. I don't know. It was very heartbreaking to me. <sighs> yeah. So then, they find out that basically the only way to stop Wu is to get rid of the laurel tree. Because it is going to give him, like, an, a never-ending army. Because he can keep, like, taking the seeds and taking dead bodies of people and making them into his army. It was probably different. My battery was dying, so I had to change it out. Okay, so the only way to stop him, or to stop him is to destroy the laurel tree. Um, so they need to, they find out they need to go to the sun goddess, who obviously has a beef with Shingen and her family because those were the, her children were the ones that Ho Yi had killed great. Uh, so they have to go to the sun goddess because they have to get a phoenix feather and it's the only thing that is intense enough and has enough heat that can destroy the laurel tree. So they have to go get one of these feathers. Um, but Shingen's dad is who killed the nine sunbirds, but the dragons told Shingen that she is the only one 
who could stop the cycle and anger of the sun goddess. So we'll kind of see. So a whole bunch of stuff happens. They get the feather. Um, but the sun goddess didn't really forgive her. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, or I don't know. They're like basically on the same boat with her as when they started. So I'm like, I don't know what the dragons were talking about. Like nothing really happened. Like she gave them the feather. But not because like she forgave them or her anger really stopped towards them. Like she still hates them. So I don't quite understand that. But anyways. Um, so then they get the feather and Shingen ends up caving and kissing Wenji. Because it was just her and Wenji there. Li Wei had taken his mom uh, to the Phoenix Kingdom uh, to get away from Wu. And when he got back he finds Wenji and Shingen kissing. Uh, she literally has no idea what to feel. She keeps denying her feelings towards him. Um, and I was just heartbroken for Li Wei. Like, of course he ends up seeing that. He literally cannot catch a break. I'm telling you, my boy Li Wei cannot catch a break. He is just like destined for heartbreak, basically. So they have to take that feather she got and plant it by the laurel tree to destroy it. Like they have to get the feather like into the roots of the tree. That's the only way it's going to destroy it. But Wu has the moon heavily guarded. And the only person that he'll let near the laurel tree is Chunga because the laurel tree has a connection to Chunga as well. And um, her tears or her blood, her blood actually, can actually make the seeds just fall right off the tree. She doesn't even have to like injure the tree or anything like that. And so Wu obviously wants her captive because he's going to use her to like get the seeds off and never have to like do much work to do it basically. Uh, so Xing Yan, however, won't let her mom be used um, to get near the tree because she knows that like you know, it's just not going to work. Her mom has no way to protect herself. Like, she has no magic or anything like that. Although she has to have some. They must be in her tears. But anyways. Um, so the only way to get near it is to trick Wu into letting herself near the tree. Um, as if she is disguised as her mom. But because he knows her mom well, she needs something that's like a complete disguise that even changes her aura. Because just changing her face isn't going to be enough. Um... And the only way to do that is there's this ancient magic with this scroll that the Demon King actually has. And he'll only grant it, so they're like, we need the scroll to do this spell to di fully disguise myself as my mom. So they go to the Demon King, and the only way that he'll grant them the scroll is if her and Wenji marry. And they have to marry before he gives her the enchantment. And Shingen's like, why would he want me to marry you? Like, it doesn't make sense. But it is a good marriage. Like, she has a strong bloodline. That kind of thing. But anyways, um, at this point, Shingen was really pissing me off. Okay? She is playing both Wenji and Li Wei. And I just feel terrible for both of them. She claims to love both. And no matter what she chooses, she'll be her in the process. But what is what she's doing to these guys is absolutely terrible. Like, give me a break. Like, are you 12 or something? Like, you need to make up your mind and actually look at your feelings and figure it out. Because you can't love both of them the exact same amount. And the a love, I feel like, couldn't possibly be the same. Like, I do not understand what's going on. Um, she keeps stringing them both along. And I was just, honestly, by this point, super annoyed. I was like, you need to figure it out and finish it. Like... You can't keep doing this to both of them. It's so cruel. Really makes me mad. Um, and again, it goes back to she thinks that whoever she loves should give up everything and do whatever she wants to do. But she's not willing to give up anything. She's not willing to have her mom do the stuff. She's not willing to take on a life that she doesn't want. She's not willing to do anything for either of these guys. She thinks that they should have to give up everything for her. And I'm like, that's so childish and immature. Like, that's not how love works. You both have to give and take. And Lee Wei has given up as much as he can. He sacrificed his relationship with his parents. He sacrificed his standing with his whole, like, kingdom. I mean, he's done everything he can for you. The only thing he can't do is renounce 
his title and like not be emperor. And that's not enough for her. Ma'am. Okay. So they ended up being able to trick the king and they had like a gust of wind blow through the ceremony. Um, and the ceremony, basically you get married after doing three vows, like one to like the parents, one to, I forget who, and then one to each other. And the last one that's to each other, um, they had the gust of wind blow to distract everyone and they technically didn't do the vows. So they're not technically married. But then Wenji's older brother, who is super hateful, we met him in the first book, he interrupted the ceremony and actually killed the king. Yeah, he killed him. Uh, he also tried to kill Wenji, but Shingen killed him before he could. It was really sad. Like, Wenji couldn't kill him because it's like his half-brother. Like, he couldn't work up the nerve to kill him. And so he turned his back to go to his dad, and he was about to kill Wenji, and so Shingen killed him. So now Wu is outside the cloud wall. So that whole situation happened. Technically, Wenji is now king. And so they're kind of planning to do, like, the enchantment on Shingen after Wenji studies the scroll for a smidgen of time. And now Wu is outside the cloud wall. And he had been in cahoots with Wenji's older brother, actually, who had promised him Chunga. So Shingen is going to have um, Wenji disguise her as her mom and have Wu take her to the moon where she will destroy the laurel. And basically she's disguised as her mom and they set up a trap for Wu to take her because he knows that Wenji would never willingly give over Chang'e. So instead of like willingly giving over Shingen disguised as her, they set it up like they were trying to hide and protect her. But in reality, they were setting Wu up. And so he comes and takes Shingen disguised as Chang'e. And so she is able to, he like ties her up to the tree and, um, he cuts her thinking she's Chunga to try to get the laurel seeds, but it actually was releasing um, because she put the feather. They have this way they can take the magic and actually like put an object in their mind, basically. And so the feather, she was able to like have it leak out through her blood and she's able to destroy the tree. Perfect. And when the tree was destroyed, it actually killed all of the soldiers. So that's really good because like I said, Wu had had people outside the cloud wall and actually there was a battle going on when him and Xingyan, um left. So um, there actually had been a battle going on. So Xingyan's like, good, hopefully not too many people were killed during this time. And like, hopefully, you know, things, hopefully not too many people are dead, basically. Um, but now she is super weakened from carrying the feather and then having to release it because it's so hot. It was like burning her on its way out. And it's basically she actually is dying. Um, and when she was enchanted to be her mom to trick Wu, Wenji had to cast that spell, like we said. And actually when he cast the spell, it caused them to have a tie, a connection. And when he did that, um, before she broke the enchantment to set fire to the tree, Wenji had actually drained himself of all of his power as well, trying to keep the connection and keep her safe and alive because he could feel her draining. So they're both actually dying. Um, her parents, Wenji and Liwei, show up just in time to kill Wu before he kills her because obviously the enchantment wears off. He realizes that it's not Chang'e and also just destroyed the tree and his army. So he's very mad. And so that's all happening. They kill him just in time. But now Shingen is like dying on the ground. And Wenji comes up. He's dying. They confess their love to each other. Okay. And the laurel tree is gone. Like there's just a stump. And it's almost dead. So very interestingly, Wenji dies first. Like has his last breath first. And then Shingen actually dies too. And she's like, like her soul whatever's hovering over the group she can see everybody and she feels very at peace but her mom started to cry and it caused the laurel tree to release just enough healing sap to heal one of them and it chose Shingen. so Shingen gets healed from the laurel tree regenerates comes back to life and she's devastated because when she's no longer alive um she finally admits and realizes that she loves wenji but then she's also like, but I love Li Wei too, who will always be a part of me. I'm like, girl. But I will note, when the sap went to her and healed her, 
like the ash from the tree covered Wenji's body, but Wenji is still dead. But keep in mind the ash covering his body, okay? And then we learn, this was a holy crap little moment, that the Empress was actually killed in the battle before Shingen was able to destroy the laurel tree. So the Empress had been fighting on behalf of the Phoenix Kingdom. The Phoenix Kingdom had sent soldiers over to help the Cloud Wall. And um, she was fighting. And the way the Empress was, was completely different. Like you could tell being with the Emperor and not just being with the Emperor, but because he um, would constantly like cheat on her and have concubines and stuff like that. He, she was a completely different person. And when she was actually like on her Phoenix and in battle, it was like she was glowing and a completely different person and like at peace and free. It was very interesting. So Shingen actually kind of relates a little bit more to the Empress when she realizes these things. And now that she's dead, like she's kind of fully processing things. So then it's kind of like Shingen is just, struggling so she truly loved Wenji more than she realized which very obvious for the rest of us but whatever and she's miserable even months after his death she officially tells Leeway that she can't marry him she'd been dragging him on for these last few months like he thought that they were like working their way up into marriage and Leeway had been acting since the battle as emperor his dad hadn't officially stepped down but he had been having Leeway do everything and Leeway was like I was honestly going to propose to you, like, say, let's get married. You've been acting basically as empress with me this whole time. Like, I thought we were on the same page. So she tells him she can't marry him because she can't be empress. She hates it and she'll grow resentful, whatever. Leeway, anyway, I'm telling you, my boy, he's treated very badly in this series, okay? Poorly, 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 poorly. So then Shingen ends up leaving the Jade Palace and it's years later. She's been kind of like traveling to places, trying to heal, and she keeps going back to the cloud wall because she feels like she can feel Wenji's spirit. Um, but then all of a sudden one day, like she can't feel his spirit anymore and she panics. She's like, what the heck, what happened to him? And she flies back to the Jade Palace and she, Li Wei is officially emperor at this point. And she asks him, she's like, I can't feel him anymore. What happened? And it turns out that when the laurel saved her and its ashes went over Wenji, it actually preserved his spirit. So she had been feeling that. And he was actually reborn now. Like the reason why she can't feel him now is because he had been reborn. And he is living in the mortal realm. Li Wei knew his spirit had been like preserved, but he didn't want to give... Um, he didn't want to get Shingen's hopes up because his spirit had been so weak. They weren't sure if he would be able to be reborn, but he was. And so in a few years, when Li Wei has made an elixir of immortality, it takes years to make one, sometimes decades, he's going to give it to Shingen for Wenji, who will then remember his life when he was immortal before, because he doesn't remember being Wenji or anything like that. Li Wei, again, like I said, had told her about her spirit before in case they, he couldn't be reborn. Um, he will be made immortal again, though, even if it's not, like, in this lifetime, it will be the next one. Like, he'll keep being reborn until they can get an elixir, basically. And poor Li Wei, he still loves Shingen. He is not married. He hasn't moved on. He hasn't, like, had an heir, because people keep saying, like, he'll get married. He'll have an empress and heir, because it has to be, like, it has to happen. I'm telling you, Li Wei got screwed over in this book. Like, the author couldn't at least give him a happy ending in the end. Like, Li Wei is so unhappy. He literally tells Shingen, like, I love you. Like, I'm not moving on. <sighs> Anyways. So Shingen gets her happy ending, but Li Wei doesn't get one. I was not happy. I'm honestly so mad about it. Like, <sighs> I'm really upset. Okay. And that's how it ends. That's literally how it ends. Shingen 
um, finally opens herself back up to love and realizes you can't live fully without it. She goes to the mortal realm where Wenji is and gets to know him as the person he is. And he like has an immediate connection to her. He doesn't know why, but she does. And she says that, you know, in a few years, she'll tell him the truth and then they'll have him take the elixir or whatever. Um, she says that she's going to cherish the time she has with Wenji in his mortal form. And when he's immortal again, they'll obviously cherish that and go through life together. And that's literally kind of how it ends as she claims that she's like grown up, understands, realizes you need love. But then she's still like, I feel like she doesn't fully understand. And I feel like she didn't fully grow up and mature because she still doesn't understand like the fact that she's not willing to give anything up to be with these men, but she thinks they need to give things up to be with her. Like Leeway, she wanted him to give up being emperor. And it's like, he can't do that. really annoyed and mad about it. Um, I do think the writer did a better job in this book at not rushing certain things. Like the first book, I felt like there were more scenes where things were like abruptly cut off. I feel like this book had less of that. So that's good. Um, I didn't really feel that way with this one. I can't really think of anything that felt that way. So this one was definitely a little bit flowed a little bit better. Um, I still stand by my earlier note of how annoying Shang Yin was with Wen Ji and Li Wei stringing them both along and in the end Liwei got hurt and ended up alone like he's literally alone um I'm really sad for him I'm happy for Chunga and Ho Yi and that they're finally together and reunited but Liwei got completely ripped off in this book and huh, I just feel really bad for him like I can't believe the author kind of left Liwei hanging like that I don't know that was the book Heart of the Sun Warrior. It's <laughs> literally how it ends. Um, absolutely beautiful cover. I tried to kind of do like a yellow and orange look with the pink touches from the flowers. And then this is like jade green color. I don't really have anything like that, but I did put like a greeny shade that's pulling a little bit more yellow green with the yellow and orange. But this is what it looks like. Really pretty. Turned out not too bad over here, even though I was having some issues because, not because of the shadow, but because of my eyes and having had oh, makeup on earlier and then taking it off. But I think it came out really pretty. So I'll list everything in the description down below. I would love to know your thoughts if you've read this book in this series, like what your thoughts are, how you felt. Did you feel the same about Shingen? Because honestly, I'm still not happy at the end of this. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, so that's my thoughts. I'd love to know your guys's, and I will see you in two weeks with another book video. My next book I'm reading is The Priory of the Orange Tree. I think that's what it's called, right? Yeah, I'm really excited to start that one. So yeah, I will see you guys in two weeks with that book, and then I also do videos every Friday as well.